Hello and welcome to my review of The Spy Who Loved Me. <clears throat> the Spy Who Loved Me is the 10th film in the James Bond franchise. This is the start of Albert R. Cubby Broccoli's solo one as Bond producer. And boy, what a start. The Spy Who Loved Me is the second in what I call the James Bond masterpiece collection. The others are Goldfinger, GoldenEye and Skyfall. The film's villain is Kurt Jurgens as Carl Schomburg, who's not the most funny remembered villain, but I think he's just okay. The, I just think he's not hes not the most remembered villain, but he's also definitely far from the worst. And, um, Bond Girl this time. Is, uh, the gorgeous barber back as Major An Anya Amosova, Agent Triple X, who's uh, who's very much supposed to be one of two things: Bond's equal, or the the old saying of the Soviet, the, of the Russian and, and the Englishman, the West and the East teaming up sort of thing, which is you know, I don't know how you how you put that, but hey. Um, and we also have the introduction of one one of, if not the most famous henchman in cinematic history, Richard Keel, Richard Keel's Jaws, who is well. He's fucking Jaws, so enough said. Let's be real. Jaws. Um, we also have the debut of Jeffrey Keane as Frederick Gray, uh, which is uh, one of the recurring characters that appears between 1977 and 1987 in every single James Bond film. So those films are The Spy Who Loved Me, Moonraker for Your Eyes Only, Octopus, The View to a Kill, and The Living Daylights. So yeah, that character is introduced in The Spy Who Loved Me, along with a character called um, Admiral Hardgraves, who's played by Robert Brown, who would, who would go on to play uh, M in Octopussy after the unfortunate passing of Bernard Lee in 1981, before the starting of the shooting of the Fuel Eyes only actually began. Um, we have uh, standout scenes included uh, the Lotus Chase featuring the submarine car, sequences in the hull of the tanker, and the iconic pre title sequence with the famous skis over the edge of the uh, snowy mountain area. And then the, the parachute and then the Bond theme starts playing. That That's a really cool thing. I like it. I think it's epic. <laughs> uh, the wet bike to Atlanta scene. And uh, we have music this time is by uh, Marvin Hamlish, who filled in for veteran John Barry, who's unavailable to work in the United Kingdom because of tax reasons. And this is because shortly after the release of The Man with the Golden Gun, John Barry moved to America, where he lived for the rest of his life. So every subsequent Bond film he did after that, he would come take a plane from america to the uk to come to the studio to score each bond film and when it came time to you know ask him to do this one he wasn't able to do that because he was uh, for tax reasons in america that he couldn't come over and for the required time to actually score despite who loved me so we have marvin amish here who is the who fun fact this film's score is the only james bond score to be uh nominated for an oscar in 1977 but you also may know that 1977 was a year another famous film with a very famous score came out and obviously that was star wars so it was nominated up against star wars and it had no chance star wars did actually win john williams star wars score won the oscar for best original score that year and rightfully so i still i don't know why this out of all the scores was the one that got nominated when much of barry's work is far superior to this score it's not the best it's definitely out of the three more era scores that didn't have uh barry you can tell i really care quite a bit about the music in these films like one of my favorite parts of it um out of the three that didn't have barry um, that is obviously Living and Die, uh, despite her loving this film, and Fear Eyes Only, this one is the weakest, because I think George Martin's work on, on Living and Die is brilliant, uh, and I think Conti's work, Bill Conti's work on Fear Eyes Only is one that's getting better in my books, I'm enjoying it a lot more, with some empty pieces, and I do like it when we get other composers who aren't John Barry or David Arnold to, uh, come in and actually do music, because you get to see someone else put their spin on Bonds, you have Monty Norman who did the original film, which wasn't no, um, <laughs> you have George Martin who did an excellent job in Living and Die, incorporating the actual Living and Die song by Paul McCartney into the score for that one, brilliant score. You have Marvin Hamish here who does a good job, a lot of the music is, is, is fairly good but it's far from the best and it does sometimes sound like the screechy score that, uh, my, uh, that Mar Monty Norman gave us for the Doctor Night. And then you have Bill Conti for In For Your Eyes Only whose work is very 80s sounding and it's really cool and I really enjoy it. Uh, but then you also, also have Cayman who did Justice to Kill who did Brilliant. With that, that score is my favourite personal Bond score of all time. But yeah, I think it's interesting to see other people put their take on it. And uh, also it's interesting to compare them with the unofficial scores. So we have Jerry Goldsmith from Casino 54, which is rumoured but not 100% proven because it might just be stock music used in that film. But then we do have a complete original score for Casino 1967 by Burt Baccarat and then the, the 
the original score to Never Seen Never Again by Michael Lagrano. So out of those two, people often consider the Casino Rally 67 one superior, and I'm, I'm inclined to agree with it. But yeah, that's the score for this film. Um, I think it just helps music. It's something that really, really makes a film make or break, and if it's not very good, then you sort of lose yourself. And a lot of this film is unscored, which isn't something, which is totally something John Barry you know, is done loads of times in every single one from there's a lot of there's at least one scene that's completely unscored moonraker the, the the fight in the uh moonraker the fight in the the church bell tower i think that's completely unscored there's a there's a lot of scenes that are completely unscored in one films and that's good but i feel like with this film moonraker particularly the unscoredness is very obvious because when you look at the soundtrack albums and compare them to what well, and golden gun actually man the golden gun spiral of moonraker have the most unscored scenes in the film what well, actually Mamma the Golden Gun doesn't, but it has a very short, what I'm trying to say is that the soundtrack listings for Spiral Love Me and Remaker are very short, 10 tracks each, and that's purely because there isn't much score to go off of, because it's mostly unscored film for Spiral Love Me, more so than Moonraker, but also Moonraker in some places as well, so, yeah, that's the score, it's something I care quite a lot about, if you want to hear me go uh, in-depth score reviews, I would happily do that at some point in time, but hey, uh, to conclude, the Spiral Love Me is a masterpiece and that is no understatement it was a huge success and uh it was great to see bond back in back on track again back in the world and back in you know at the top it was a brilliant film it is one of the best bond films ever made it's definitely one of the best james bond film by a long shot it's just everything about it's brilliant it's also a testament to how good lewis gilbert the director is at directing bond films also providing us with one of the more the other more visually uh wonderful film to look at that is of course um you only live twice, and also the following Moonmaker. So yeah, it's just a testament to how good his skills really are as a director. And uh, I just like to say that you know, the, also the huge success, and thus with the recent success of at the time George Lucas's uh, Star Wars, there was only one place Bond could go, and that was space. Thank you guys for watching my Spy Life Me review. Um, more reviews coming tomorrow. We have we're gonna have the review for Moonmaker up, and tonight I have to watch the. Uh, as I described to my friends on Discord, the torturous experience that is never say never again. So wish me luck and hope I don't cut, uh, kill myself during the process. Don't do that in context. I don't mean that. That's really stupid. I might cut that out. But yeah. Oh yeah, wish me luck because that film is literally the worst James Bond film ever made, period. T. And I don't kill anyone. It says it's a piece of shit and it's to die. Uh, thank you for uh, watching the review. Uh, again, Letterboxd review in the description, link in the description. I'm going to put Flame Fox in the description again just because... I'm going to keep doing it in, in, until we do things, so which is not, not me trying to force him to do it, but I just want to, you know, promote the guy, and it just makes sense now that I've been putting him in every single description, so yeah, enjoy that. Uh, I hope maybe one day in the future I get to do a collab with the guy, because that would be lots of fun, but how we would do that, I don't know. Um, but yeah, thanks for watching, guys. More movie reviews coming soon. I've recently gained access to Disney+, Plus, so I'm going to be uh, utilising that stream, that service, to watch movies soon, hopefully. So yeah, once this whole James Bond series concluded, I want to branch out into different movies. I'm thinking of... Either uh, do I think what I'm going to start off with after Bond is Mission Impossible because those films are brilliant and I love the first one is an intense spy thriller and then they get the you know sort of thing I think that would be a great so that's what I'm going to do Mission Impossible and then after that it's just up to me where I want to go with it so it could go anywhere it could go to Marvel Studios I'm looking at comic book movies as a big I've got a whole shelf dedicated to uh, comic book movies from you know 2000 from 1998 to to, to now. I've got, and I've got Blu-rays of the modern ones, like, you know, everything from 2019 onwards, got all that stuff, so I'm thinking combat movies is a good one to go for. Anyway, stay tuned for more stuff, and have a wonderful day. Goodbye for now, and no time to die. Hits theatres October 8th, 2021. And don't forget to follow my Instagram, where I'm doing the 007 25 day challenge, where each day there's a list of criteria things, and you tell your favourite, like, favourite Bond, favourite film, favourite score piece, stuff like that. I'm going to do that on my Instagram, so go and check that out now. And uh, yeah, my first day one is there. It's my favourite Bond, which if you know me, you know that's obviously Timothy Dalton. So have fun with that. Um, and see you guys later. Don't forget to check all the links in the description. Bye-bye.